Thank you for observing the ECOWAS anthem. We'll move on to the next item on the agenda, and I'll be calling on Dr. Chinwe Ochu, the Director of Prevention Programs and Knowledge Management of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. She's going to be welcoming us and um, taking the introductions. Dr. Ochu, over to you. Thank you very much, Kachi. The Director General, West African Health Organization, ably represented. Chief Executives, Director Generals, and Directors of Ministries, Departments and Agencies of Nigeria, Ghana, and Cameroon, and other African countries here present. Country Directors, World Health Organization, US CDC, University of Maryland, Baltimore, and University of New Mexico. Other development partners, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm very excited to welcome you to another milestone event in our COVID-19 pandemic experience in Africa. The pandemic has thrown at us unprecedented challenges as well as very rare opportunities. As a continent, Africa must leverage these rare opportunities of the pandemic to build systems and structures, strengthen regional collaborations, and build strong networks that will impact positively on our health emergency preparedness and response efforts. We must make global and indigenous knowledge accessible and translational. We must pull our resources together and harness the rich intellectual resources and collective wisdom based on diverse experiences in managing the outbreak. Knowledge sharing must be prioritized at these critical times. As the whole world reels from the negative influence of nationalism, in access to therapeutics, vaccines, and diagnostics, there is a compelling need for African countries to stand strong together in seeking to address our common challenges. This is even more important considering the scarcity of resources that is even now aggravated by the pandemic. It is in this spirit that a regional knowledge sharing platform was conceived and conceptualized for the West African region. We are hopeful that the success of this project will trigger similar projects across other African regions and possibly coalesce into a wider African knowledge sharing forum. The West Africa Regional Echo for COVID-19 provides a learning and knowledge sharing platform for countries in the West African region using a hub and spokes model in running a public health community of practice. Subject matter experts across the various pillars of the incident management structure and thematic areas in case management will share their knowledge through various case scenarios. Healthcare workers and frontline public health workers will be able to log in and share practical experiences and also ask questions to improve their knowledge and practice. Mary Boyd will be sharing more details on the worry structure as we progress. Once again, I welcome you all and I appreciate that you could take time out of your very busy schedules to grace this um, monumental event. Thank you very much and welcome. And sorry, I couldn't uh, turn on my video because I'm having internet issues. You're welcome. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Ochu, for your address. We'll go right ahead into the goodwill messages. We have a couple of stakeholders and organizations present on the call who would wish to lend their voices um, to this occasion. So we'll first of all start off with the Federal Ministry of Health Nigeria. And I'll be calling on the Director, Department of Hospital Services, Dr. Adebimpe Adebi. Please, if you're on the call, go ahead uh, with your goodwill message. Thank you. Do we have Dr. Adebinpe Adebi on the call to represent the Federal Ministry of Health? All right, so we move on to the next organization, which is the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, NPHCDA in Nigeria. On the call, we have Dr. Faisal Shua, who is the company director of NPHCDA. Do we 
Hi, Kachi, we, we lost audio there for a bit, so you might want to repeat that, please. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. So I'm calling on the NPHCDA, the National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, to go ahead with their goodwill message. Uh, and thank you very much. Um, I have not yet grasped the, the protocol, so I don't want to jump, uh, I don't want to step on anybody's uh, toys. So I will say uh, good afternoon all. Uh, and uh, on behalf of my uh, executive director and chief executive, Dr. Faisal Shire, uh, I, I present our goodwill message to the forum. Uh, NPCDA very much welcomes uh, this initiative and looking at the, the objectives of um, WARE, uh, it is very much in line with, uh, what, uh, with, with uh, the ambitions and the aspirations of NPCDA, especially when it comes to uh, COVID-19. The works of uh, NCDC uh, are very much closer to that of NPCDA. So we are sister organizations and our works normally uh, complement each other for the general good. Therefore, it is an initiative that we very much welcome and we assure you of our very close collaboration uh, and uh, ensuring that at every step uh, we are required, we will make our contributions for uh, the success of the entire uh, initiative. So this is a very simple and a very short uh, remark uh, that uh, my chief executive has uh, directed me to pass, uh, just to assure you uh, that we are together and uh, we very much welcome the, the initiative. Thank you very much and God bless you. Very much, Dr. Abdullahi. Um, apologies, Dr. Garba Abdullahi is the Director of Planning, Research and Statistics at the NPHCDA, and he's joined alongside Drs. Bassi, Opeyemi, and Mortala. Thank you very much, sir, for giving that goodwill message on behalf of your CD. I will move on to the WHO, the World Health Organization, and we have Dr. Walter Kazadi Molombo, who is the country director of the country rep for Nigeria. Uh, can you go ahead with your goodwill message, sir? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I also stand on uh, existing uh, protocol. This is not Dr. Uh, Kazadi. I'm Dr. Luca Ibrahim, uh, working in the WHO country office in Nigeria. I'm representing the country director who is unavoidably absent at this moment. In fact, he is in another meeting that relates to the COVID-19. Um, at this moment. So he asked me to uh, represent him. Um, as I said, I stand on uh, existing uh, protocol. Um, we want to say that since the first COVID-19 uh, detected in Nigeria, WHO had been on the forefront of ensuring uh, the capacity building of uh, all the staff that are responding to this pandemic. And being a new pandemic, of course, there is need to train people. And with the limited resources that are available, with the limited available resources, of course, meeting people physically to train becomes a very Herculean tax. And we we'll want to say that we welcome this initiative uh, using the ECO model by the West African Re Regional uh, um, Office, which we, this is a very welcome idea. Just to state that we are or used to the ECO model, we are already implementing it in the uh, public health surveillance that is promoting the integrated disease surveillance and response. And, and, and we are also uh, using the ECO model in the HIV TB um, program. So um, <clears throat> we, we understand how important it is um, and it will actually go a very long way to support 
the capacity building for, for, to control this disease. So I want to assure everyone that this is a very, very welcome idea and we will do everything possible to support this initiative. So once again, thank you for inviting us and want to also congratulate NCDC for coming up with this uh, very good initiative. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you very much, sir, for giving that good message on behalf of your country rep. We appreciate you. So we'll move on to the West African Health Organization and um, representing the country rep, we have Professor Sombi Isaka on the call. Can you go ahead with your goodwill message? Do we have Professor Isiaka on the call? So we can see you, but it seems your sound is not turned on. Can you check that? Uh, Professor Sombi, it seems Hello. Yes. Have you, oh. have you hear me now? Okay, we can hear you, sir. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to speak on behalf of uh, the Director General of West African Health Organization, Professor Stanley Okolo, that are uh, very happy to be in part of this process. And wow, want to thank all the organizers of this platform. And as you know, since the beginning of COVID-19, building capacity and sharing experience is one of the key activity we all start to promote within the region by one of the platform that give us opportunity to organize more than 35 webinars within the West Africa. For that, WAO is very happy to be in this platform and WAO will work with uh, all the partners for the success. And we congratulate all the partners here and we call for all the partners here to participate for the success of this platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Sombi, for giving that goodwill message on behalf of Professor Stanley Okolo, who is the DG Waho. Thank you very much. I uh, will move on now to the Ministry of Health, Ghana. And uh, for this goodwill message, we have Dr. Ali Samba, who is the Director of Medical Affairs for Lebo Teaching Hospital, and the Ghana Ministry of Health Case Management Coordinator for COVID-19 for the COVID-19 Task Force. Uh, Dr. Ali Samba, if you're on the call, go ahead with your good message. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Um, Dr. Samuel Kaba is the Director for Institutional Care Division, Ghana Health and Ministry of Health. Uh, we're delivering the goodwill message on behalf of the Ministry of Health Ghana. Dr. Kaba, please. Uh, thank you so very much, Dr. Lee Samba, and good afternoon, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Uh, all protocols duly observed by levels. Uh, I bring you greetings from the Minister of Health and Ghana Health Service. And um, we want to say one of the biggest things that COVID has brought is to bring people together. Both the, the, the young, the old, the strong and the weak, rich countries and poor countries, for everybody to understand that no one should be left behind and also find innovative ways of getting things done. And one of those ways is how do we do it like the way we've been met right now and the way we want to do it going forward. Um, looking at the comprehensive nature of the program, where it will include surveillance, case management, and all components of COVID, we are very glad 
that uh, we are part of this meeting today and we'll be glad to have this implemented and it should be well. accepted and well implemented in Ghana. To the organizers, to the people who came up with this, and to everyone. Thank you very much, Dr. Kaba, for that goodwill message on behalf of the Federal Ministry of Health Ghana. I will move on to our representative for representing the Ministry of Health Cameroon. And we have your goodwill message Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for giving me the floor. I am pleased to talk on behalf of the Minister of Public Health to say that since the COVID-19 pandemic hit the world, the world as we know it has changed. The pandemic has demanded our quick action, resilience, and above all, innovation. Like many countries represented here, since Cameroon confirmed our first case of COVID-19, we have made to mitigate its effects by issuing public health preventive measures. These measures force us to change the way we work and relying more on technology has become a necessity. Cameroon Ministry of Health is pleased to be a part of this consortium and look forward to support our colleagues here. We we'll provide as well as what we will also contribute even as we scale up Echo Hubs throughout Cameroon. With the help of the WARE Consortium, we will establish 10 hubs that will support multiple spokes across the country. Again, we are thrilled to be here at the launch and look forward to a prolific collaboration. All right. Uh, sorry, Linda, um, we seem to have lost you. Are you still on the call? Okay, thank you very much, Linda Esso, for your goodwill message on behalf of the Ministry of Health Cameroon. Without further ado, we'll move on to the next organization, which is the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And uh, giving the goodwill message on behalf of the US CDC, we have Dr. Mahesh Swaminathan, who is country director of Nigeria. Dr. Mahesh, kindly go ahead with your good message. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for welcoming me to this occasion. Um, <clears throat> I think you know the people who preceded me have talked a lot about um, COVID-19 and the, and the challenges that have resulted from that. And I think it is true that uh, one of the previous speakers talked about how COVID-19 and I think crisis of that magnitude does bring us together. And what I really see this initiative is one, you know, really helping us to think through how we can preserve public health services, how we can maintain high quality programming and how we can work together and share knowledge um, without having to be in contact with each other. But I do think this is an important innovation that should really be helping us in the future. I think many of us know that, um, not always possible. And it's not just um, COVID that you know, makes it difficult, but also distance, space, and time. And I think that with this type of innovation, we really can show that we can have a much more productive um, and effective public health system. Um, one where we make dollars stretch, um, where we're able to do more with less. And even though we hope that we'll get more funding um, as a response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we should also recognize that even if our budgets do go up, or if they don't, that maximizing every dollar and every hour that we spend um, in services, a tool like this helps us that, to do that. Not just in terms of sharing information, but also being able to work with our colleagues in the field. So thank you so much for welcoming 
um, me to this session. I'm very excited for this initiative. I want to give kudos to the team that has put this together. And I'm really looking forward to um, being a part of this. And that also, um, speaking on behalf of the US CDC in Nigeria, we are very committed to supporting this and are also happy to share um, our experiences in terms of using this tool and how it's really made a positive um, impact in our work. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahesh, for your continued support and commitment uh, to our cause. We thank you very much, sir. Um, we'll move on to the University of Maryland, Baltimore. And uh, on behalf of the University of Maryland, Baltimore, we have Dr. Sylvia Adebajo, who is the country director of the Nigeria program. Dr. Sylvia, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon and good morning, colleagues and um, stakeholders, all protocols observed. My name is Sylvia de Bajo, and I'm the country director of UMB Nigeria. I'm highly honored and privileged to give this goodwill message on behalf of the global director, Mancharat, and the entire UMB family um, at this special event. UMB Nigeria, in collaboration with the Federal Ministry of Health, has been implementing a national ECHO program uh, to enhance the knowledge and skills of um, healthcare workers in the HIV response since 2017. We started with 14 facilities during the first pilot um, in 2017, and currently we will see a strong virtual community of over 300 service delivery facilities as the spoke sites and over 3,500 healthcare workers across the nation. The ECHO model works because it uses all teach or learn approach where tele-mentoring is accessible to healthcare workers, even in the most rural and remote areas, leaving no one behind. As part of the COVID response, UMB expanded its work um, to, uh, of the, the National ECHO Program to support the COVID pandemic tr um, trainings, training needs of healthcare um, frontline workers. This has resulted in a strong partnership with NCDC. We are pleased to be part of the West African Regional um, COVID ECHO Consortium to provide timely training to healthcare workers on COVID-19, um, looking specifically at surveillance, diagnosis, management, and risk mitigation. And to establish and expand the ECHO hubs to West Africa countries and measure the impact of ECHO ne network in the um, COVID-19 response. We're sure to once again, we're very sure that this will be a successful program that will support our healthcare workers and provide a platform for continued learning and development. I'd like to use this opportunity of congratulating our colleagues from Ghana and the Cameroons, and also to congratulate ourselves, NCDC, the government of Nigeria, the University of New Mexico, and of course, the, University, um, the, the US government of Nigeria through CDC. I'd like to thank you all, and it's a pleasure to be part of this, and I wish everyone a successful launching um, program this afternoon. Thank you, and um, over, over. Thank you very much, Dr. Sylvia, for your goodwill message. I will move on to the University of New Mexico, uh, who are actually the founders of the ECHO model, as we know it. Um, on behalf of the Institute, we have Professor Bruce Strominger, the Senior Associate Director, ECHO Institute, University of New Mexico, Albuquerque, and um, he'll be giving the goodwill message on behalf of UNM. Dr. Chris, over to you. Bruce, we can't hear you. Bruce, it seems we can't hear you. Uh, can you check your audio, please? Thank you.
test, test. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, sorry about that. Little IT difficulty, but we quickly overcame it. So good day, colleagues. Uh, good day, uh, Dr. Ochu and Dr. Chikwe and distinguished Nigeria CDC colleagues, distinguished US CDC colleagues in Nigeria and in Atlanta, distinguished uh, University of Maryland colleagues, and all distinguished colleagues here today. It's really a pleasure and an honor to join you and bring you goodwill greetings from the University of New Mexico and the Project ECHO team. Uh, it is really amazing to see all the people gathered here today from across West, Af West Africa and the world. The main message I want to bring is that despite or, or thanks to this biggest public health pandemic in the last hundred years, we have as a community come together with innovative ideas like the one that the West Africa Regional ECHO Initiative is starting to uh, rise to the challenge of this public health uh, adversity by working together. And the only way we will overcome this adversity is by better collaborating, better communicating, better coordinating all our efforts, sharing best practices as rapidly as we possibly can across our countries and regions. And uh, it really has been amazing over the last year to see how across Africa, in particular, uh, the enthusiastic embrace of uh, using technology, to connect ourselves. One of the things I love about ECHO is we're using technology not to disconnect from other people, but to actually come closer together. Even though I'm sitting in my kitchen in New Mexico and I'm seeing all of you uh, across the world, we are together for this moment and we're going to be able to uh, much, much more quickly and much more effectively find solutions together, not only to COVID-19, but there will be other public health challenges now and in the future beyond COVID-19 that we will need to address. And you're laying the groundwork for being able to, to do that today. We've already accomplished a number of things. I, I am seeing on the network, not only uh, multiple colleagues from public health uh, work I've been involved in over the last 15 years. But in particular, I see my colleague, Dr. Tala in Ghana, who worked with me in Cote d'Ivoire 12 years ago and on avian influenza. And, you know, here today, we're seeing each other for the first time in years, but, but we're going to connect uh, soon after today's call. So the, the network's already working. And uh, I just want to congratulate everyone here who, who had the vision to, to build on what you've already to uh, address public health challenges. And with that, I just want to share the microphone with my colleague, Dr. Leonard Bikinezi with the Ministry of Health in Namibia, who's really been one of the greatest ECHO champions and representing the first ECHO program in Africa with the Ministry of Health there. Leonard, over to you. Uh, thanks, Bruce, and good day to, to everyone. Uh, it's such a great privilege to, to be part of this launch. And I was just thinking to myself, um, five years back in 2015, around November, we are also launching the first ECHO in Africa. And fast forward now, a lot has happened in terms of uh, the expansion of this ECHO model, not only in terms of countries, but also in terms of subject areas that are now being covered. And this is just a sign of how Africa continues to embrace technology, especially to improve healthcare delivery through technology. And also, this can only be possible due to the close collaboration amongst various stakeholders working in different countries, of course, led by the good leadership of the various ministries of health. So I just want to congratulate my colleagues uh, in West Africa on this great initiative. And I look forward to, hear, to hearing their lessons learned, the impact of this initiative 
on the Africa Meta Echo Collaborative Echo, which is a monthly echo that we have every last Thursday of the month, not only for COVID lessons, but looking beyond COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bikinesi, for your remarks. Um, we appreciate you. So um, we will also um, like to call on the WHO uh, representative for Nigeria, Dr. Kazani Molombo. He actually um, wasn't on the call initially, but he has requested uh, to give some additional remarks. Uh, Dr. Kazani, if you're on the call, kindly go ahead uh, with your uh, message. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, uh, colleagues, partners, uh, friends. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ocho, for giving me this opportunity to address this uh, big event. I was actually on the call, but I was uh, following up on my phone, and uh, my phone couldn't follow. Uh, just to say that technology can also give us some, some uh, you know, unexpected event. Uh, nevertheless, thank you so much, and. Uh, I would like to express my, my excitement uh, seeing this initiative being launched today. Uh, WHO is uh, fully engaged with, has been fully engaged with the NCDC, with um, African CDC, and I, I would like to pay building upon uh, a successful experience already in the East. And we hope uh, other such uh, initiative, we follow through so that we can learn from each other on how to better protect um, Africa from emerging diseases. COVID-19 has taught us a lot. So it has um, revealed fractures in the way health system are disconnected from health security. So the launch of the ECHO initiative, the West Africa Regional ECHO initiative, will provide some avenue on how to address issues of health system strengthening, but also health security as two sides of the same coin. Thank you so much for bringing us uh, on uh, this uh, launching ceremony. We'll continue with the Federal Minister of Health, with NPACDA, with the West African uh, Health Organization and the uh, Thank you so much for having us. You can count on WHO to continue to provide our back serving support as needed. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Malongo, for that uh, message and your show of support to the so next on the agenda, we have the introduction of the West Africa Regional Echo. And for this segment, we will be calling on Mary Adetinuke Boyd, who is Senior Technical Advisor Prevention, USCDC, and also the Director of the WEAR Initiative. She's going to be talking a little bit about the WEAR Consortium, the approach or methodology in which um, the consortium will be using to All right, good afternoon, everyone. Can you confirm that you can hear me? Very well, yes. Okay, super. Yes, so good afternoon again. I'm Dr. Mary Boyd from CDC and I am delighted to share a very brief overview of the West Africa Regional ECHO Initiative. ECHO is an acronym. The E stands for extension, the C for community, H for health, and O for outcome. So as the name implies, um, extension for community health outcomes, this platform extends learning to communities, or we can say learning networks, and why? To help improve health outcomes. This extension is accomplished by using internet and live video to connect experts in, in a hub to learners in a spoke. And you can imagine it's, it's particularly useful where distance is a barrier. And, and like Dr. Mahesh said earlier, not just distance, but also space and time. 
And so um, how vital this now is to us in the era of COVID where we have physical distancing as well as other movement restrictions in place. Now, traditional echo in clinics allows a couple of things to happen, teleconsulting and telementoring. And what we need is that the healthcare worker in their own on what the wonderful things about echo is its adaptability so so that a tool that was once used just in the clinical setting has now been expanded to connect experts and learners across programs whether within the same country or in our case across countries and we know uh, that this also happens across continents, as our WHO colleagues also talked about, and, and all of this around a common goal or issue. When we uh, talk about ECHO, I think it's important to also highlight the impact of ECHO programs. Clinical impact has been reported uh, in a study at uh, University of New Mexico. They found similar outcomes for hepatitis C patients that were managed in rural echo sites as compared to those that were managed in the main referral center. And why? Because of the mentorship provided by the experts uh, via echo. Secondly, educational impacts was reported in Namibia. As you heard that uh, Namibia actually established the first HIV pilot project in, in, in Africa. And they saw over a couple of years improved clinical where uh, Zambia noted that patients in sites that participated in TBHIV ECHO were more likely to have received a viral load monitoring. As you all know, that's the gold standard for managing progression of HIV. And these patients were more likely to have received this um, and more likely to have completed TB preventative therapy compared to sites that did not participate in ECHO. And these were all as a result of deliberate uh, topics, curriculum topics that were discussed and uh, mentored uh, through the ECHO platform. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, there were a number of, of uh, tech philanthropists under the audacious projects that were seeking to fund technological solutions to support COVID-19 response. They elected to fund University of New Mexico to establish Project ECHO around the world to support frontline workers um, in COVID response. And then CDC was invited to help coordinate and collaborate with key stakeholders, including yourselves, so ministries of health agencies across countries, and international organizations so that we can help establish regional ECHO initiatives for COVID-19 in uh, East, Southern, and, and Western Africa. Our Southern Africa Regional ECHO um, for COVID was launched in December, and that consortium has held um, very instructive, I will say, by weekly sessions since then. Some of those colleagues of ours are, are currently on the line. So uh, this in this initiative, uh, the West Africa Regional Echo Initiative, Nigeria is playing the role of a regional hub. And Nigeria currently has uh, more than 350 or so spoke sites across the country. Uh, an additional 13 hubs will be established Um, and those funds are currently being processed um, through University of New Mexico 
and uh, the uh, implementing partners in those countries. And we expect that this is only a start. In fact, we fully expect that more countries will join, many of whom may be in different stages of um, ECHO. And we look forward to that. A consortium has been formed and representatives of uh, these consortium members are have been invited to join a curriculum committee. We, we believe this curriculum committee will be sort of the heart of uh, the war initiative as they will not only uh, help uh, complete the review of the curriculum, they will help identify subject matter experts in the region. They will review presentations and support uh, sessions that uh, will be a part of uh, the curriculum. There are several echo tracks in the works, COVID-19 response track, um, a COVID vaccine response track, a lab response, and then public health emergency operations, uh, capacity building. And these will be anchored by various um, agencies uh, within Nigeria, NCDC um, and NPHCDA. Um, and uh, these will be rolled out gradually over the year. So just want to give you a little bit of a taste of uh, the curriculum under discussion for the COVID-19 response track. Um, there are currently 26 sessions that are being discussed across uh, 10 major domains. Each will have clear learning objectives and uh, will also have a country spotlight or case scenario that will help uh, connect uh, to, to the lowest level uh, learner in the, um, in, the, in the network and will help reinforce some of the uh, key messages in, in these uh, sessions. This slide just has a little bit more detail about the learning objectives and you will receive this and, and be able to ponder it just to know that these are some of the topics that are uh, currently on, under discussion under that uh, general COVID-19 uh, response track uh, that, it, that will be anchored by NCDC. Now, the, what's not on here is that there's a, a COVID vaccine response uh, track rolled out initially Uh, Mary, we seem to have lost you. Are you still there? I'm here now. Can you hear that? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, we had a momentary uh, challenge with uh, internet connection. Uh, Mary will be back with her presentation in a moment. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm back. Can everyone hear me now? We can hear you now, Mary. Maybe you just go ahead and conclude. <laughs> okay, so I was actually done, but I can, um, I can, uh, it, it took five minutes. I can do it again in five minutes. <laughs> okay, hang on. All right. Whoa. Mary, you can take the last slide again. Yeah. yeah, it's just the concluding part, Mary. Oh, okay. Okay, hang on a second. Let me try to gain control of my screen. Apologies. Uh, okay. So, uh, where should... Can you all see my screen? Seems okay. to be coming. Okay, we can see it right now. Okay. Uh, okay. So uh, tell me where to start. Um, Mary, I think you were at the last slide, pretty oh, much. Oh, right? okay. Okay. So uh, I, I think I was just uh, giving you all a taste of uh, the, the, the curriculum. And just to let you know that uh, these are, again, under discussion. 
um, the, there are about 26 uh, topics that are being reviewed by the curriculum committee, and these are across about 10 or so major domains, each have clear learning objectives. We anticipate sessions will be every other week, so, so the next uh, meeting or the next session will be not next week, but the following week. And um, we, one of the ways that we we thought would be good to just anchor it to the lowest level learner here is by introducing a country spotlight or clinical case scenario, um, because that case-based learning is, is just one of those best practices for adult learning. Uh, this slide really just shows a bit more detail about some of the learning objectives, which you can review in, in your own time. And what I haven't shown you here is, um, I haven't given you a taste of uh, one of the other really cool tracks that uh, we have, which is the COVID-19 vaccine response track, which will be anchored by our NPHCDA colleagues. They have a pretty extensive curriculum already developed, um, and these trainings will be rolled out stepwise nationally um, and then statewide then to the the um, lowest level facilities and as they do as as, a, as we support them to do this um, best practices will also be shared uh, across the region so I'll, I'll end here and just say again thank you very much uh, for being a part of this and we look forward to uh, positive impacts uh, on the response thank you Thank you very much, Mary, for that overview of the WEAR program. We look forward to um, a fruitful uh, collaboration and implementation. Uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead to our keynote address, uh, COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, looking at the African challenge. And this is going to be taken by uh, none other than the Director General of Nigeria Center for Disease Control, Dr. Chikwe Ihekwazu. Um, so if you're on the call, please go ahead with your keynote address. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, colleagues. Um, uh, thank you for to all our sister agencies, the regional body. I uh, always need to give WAHO credit first, the West Africa Regional Organization. This, after all, is a regional program today. Uh, colleagues and sister agencies, uh, Ministry of Health, um, colleagues at the United States Center for Disease Control for all your support in setting this up, but also thanks to UMB, um, ECO India, and of course the University of New Mexico, all our partners with whom we're collaborating in putting, putting this uh, together. And I see uh, many familiar faces and names across the screen, so great to see everyone gathered here, and it's really a testament to the opportunity uh, that this provides. So I'm very grateful to all of you for joining. Uh, this really uh, is a collaborative platform. So uh, no one organization needs an echo platform to work on its own. The fact that we're here is really a testament of our recognition and acknowledgement that we are only stronger together. And there's no way we can really deal with this outbreak or future outbreaks if we don't improve our, uh, the opportunities and means and ways we have of working uh, together. So um, I'll give you a fairly tough topic, but I think I've made it a little bit easier. I'll try and share my screen. Um, uh, hoping that you can see it now. Can someone confirm? Okay. Yeah, we can see your screen. Okay, yes. great. So, you know, I know everyone on this call has heard so much about the COVID um pandemic itself so uh, and you know this is a morning afternoon and night discussion so it's it's hard to find any new angles but um the, the one part of this curve on side two is the slightly downward trend globally over the last four weeks and you know everybody is keeping fingers crossed that this trend continues some of it is obviously driven by increasing access to vaccines, unfortunately, in only some countries in the world. Uh, but we are working very hard here, led by our uh, partners, MPACDA, who are also on the call, uh, working very hard to ensure that we uh, find, uh, see the first shots going into 
the arms of Nigerians and others in West Africa over the next couple of weeks. I, I think that will really be uh, celebrated, but if there's any lesson to be learned for future outbreaks, um, timeliness has to be part of equity. And uh, this is not a scenario that we're particularly proud of, and I hope there'll be some learning. But anyway, the first thing is, there's been a good decline in cases last week, and we hope that this uh, trend uh, continues. We're seeing the same thing on the curve on, in Africa. Uh, this is obviously driven mostly by the cases in South Africa, but has also seen a significant decline with, despite not having started a vaccination program. So uh, the reduction in cases is not only driven by vaccines. There's also some very interesting, uh, uh, something very interesting going on here around the virus and how it interacts with people and the environment. And, and that's really a, a one of the things we will learn over time as we study this uh, new uh, virus, uh, understand how it spreads and uh, share that knowledge between us, which is what uh, this uh, platform provides for us. And when we look at the number of cases uh, detected on the con uh, in, in the sub, sub region, um, we've put up on this slide the number of confirmed cases, recoveries and deaths. We know that we are not finding all our cases, no doubt about that. But we also know that our trends are generally correct because they triangulate with each other. So in Nigeria, our trend cases goes alongside uh, our trends in death and also goes alongside trends in healthcare workers, trends in calls to uh, call centers. So all our data points are actually aligned with each other. But we know in terms of scale that um, we know we are definitely not finding all the cases, um, all the cases. But to be honest, maybe we don't need to find all the uh, asymptomatic cases. What we really need to do is make sure we get, uh, find and count all our severe cases, make sure they're linked to care. And, uh, and that then defines the burden of the outbreak that matters the most to all of us. But this is kind of the distribution Part of this is explained to some extent by testing capacity in these countries. And um, so, um, you know, the, a better curve here would have been to uh, put it in terms of population densities uh, for uh, aligned with the countries. Now, just a few reflections on our response uh, on the continent. Firstly, we, we all know that uh, we don't have the health uh, care workforce that we desire. Um, we are limited in many ways, and this is more, sometimes less, across uh, different West African countries, but this is our reality. But also, I'm not sure that the ratio of healthcare workers to the population in the West is also what we want to aspire to. So there must be somewhere in between. There must be something in between. There must be an efficiency angle that we can achieve through technology platforms like this that can enable us achieve the health outcomes without uh, training 100,000% more healthcare workers, which is probably what we need to do to get to the ratios that exist in the West. Uh, we had, and maybe probably still have, a deficit in our laboratory infrastructure and capacity. Uh, you know, there's, there's no other area that has grown quicker in terms of this response than in our laboratory uh, capacity in the sub-region. You know, in Nigeria, this has been an incredible opportunity for the growth of laboratory medicine. And really what we now need to add to that is all the peripheral knowledge base that needs to be associated with this in order for us to get the best value out of uh, the improvement in equipment, infrastructure and all of that. And um, you know, one big area that hasn't really been addressed uh, fully in terms of the thoughts around this is healthcare expenses. So if, if you're asking someone to come into a hospital uh, to get uh, care for a disease that has public health implications, you then cannot expect that person to make that decision based on his ability to pay. Because if he decides that he cannot pay for that care and stays at home and in the community, then he continues to spread that infection. So we must improve the opportunities and the incentives uh, for people to come into care uh, by reducing or eliminating co completely the financial impediment for care, especially uh, for infectious diseases. So these are some of uh, 
the challenges that we've had to deal with, of course, there are a lot more. Uh, is big, this is a big oversimplification of what we've had to do. But, you know, if we think about this in the, these three big categories, we can start thinking about the opportunities that we have in terms of uh, moving forward. How has our, um, our response been perceived? You know, at the beginning uh, of, I remember the end of the first quarter, early second quarter of last year, where many countries in Africa actually attempted to implement uh, the so-called non-pharmaceutical interventions. We prefer now to call them public health measures and uh, really locking down our economies. And, you know, it wasn't a surprise that we paid a big price for this in terms of the economic uh, impact on our countries. And, um, but, you know, we did what we thought we had to do uh, to buy some time to enable the public health workforce really organize themselves, uh, our clinical workforce to organize themselves. Um, in fact, I don't really think we had a choice at that time, but we also knew that this wasn't um, an approach that we could sustain by any stretch of imagination. We knew that our economies were not in a place that they could manage uh, lockdowns for longer periods. So at least in Nigeria, we were very clear that this was a temporal measure in order to scale up the response. And then we had to reopen the economy, irrespective of what we thought were the risks uh, the viruses offered. But uh, the viruses, uh, the, the, this new virus preferred for our population. But in the midst of all of that was, sorry, in the midst of all of that was a real opportunity, an opportunity to uh, increase our surveillance capabilities. And in Nigeria, we, we pushed very hard. We had started a digitalization process for our surveillance activities uh, two years prior to the outbreak. But you know, when you're trying to roll out a new program across our over 700 local governments in Nigeria, it can be quite a burdensome project. So it was slowly moving, it was slowly raising the resources. But once this outbreak came, this pandemic came, we completed this uh, rollout of SOMAS, a new platform for uh, implementing IDSR in Nigeria in a few months during the outbreak. We could not have done this without the help of technology and platforms like ECHO. So these are the things that enabled the, the pandemic or the response to the pandemic helped us move a lot faster in certain areas that we simply would not have, simply would not have happened if we were moving in peacetime. So the key thing is how do we leverage this crisis in order to improve uh, the system? The other thing we saw, at least in Nigeria, was the, the private sector was a lot more engaged. You know, for years we had been appealing to the private sector, telling them that, listen, the a pandemic will not only pose a risk to us in the health sector, will pose a big risk to their businesses, to their own bottom lines, but it seemed like a stretch uh, in everyone's imagination. No one thought this would ever happen, um, at least not in our lifetime. So when this now happened, we really saw a, a better late than never, a real engagement of the private sector in Nigeria, supporting us with uh, funds, with infrastructure, with uh, labs, you know, uh, in many parts of the country, sometimes not in an organized way, but uh, always we try to push them in the right direction and get them to, uh, uh, you know, align with a national strategy and priority. So technology in all aspects, whether it's surveillance, risk communication, uh, we had a crisis uh, team that used uh, interesting technological uh, apps to understand what people are talking about and make real-time decisions in terms of the response. I think, uh, as always, you know, necessity is the mother of uh, uh, invention. And during this outbreak, we pushed the boundaries very hard using tech to drive the response across almost every uh, part of, of the outbreak. So what are some of the lessons for us? Um, one, uh, that you know, we can implement things rapidly, even in our context where we have the challenges that we have in terms of uh, resources uh, across board. But, you know, sometimes when we're determined to act, that action is, is possible. You know, if I think back to the Ebola response four or five years ago, the biggest 
transformational, one of the biggest transformational changes that have happened on the continent uh, is the emergence of the African Center for Disease Control and the continued uh, growth of the West Africa Health Organization. These regional bodies have really brought us together to understand the resources that we have, not as individual small countries, but as a collective. And it is through that collective that a lot of uh, the response has happened. In the beginning of the outbreak, we trained, our lab, first lab training was in Senegal. Um, we've got continental-wide engagement for reagents and now for vaccines through the AVAT mechanism driven by the African Union. So a uh, regional-wide approach is very important when you're facing a pandemic. Uh, thirdly, um, you know, the existence of national public health institutes, I cannot overemphasize this point. I, I don't want to even imagine how Nigeria would have responded to this outbreak if we didn't have a national public health institute to pull the response together. And, and this is a fairly new organization. In fact, many countries in West Africa still don't have one. So how then you can have the best surveillance system, the best labs, the best EOC, but how do you pull this together to make the decisions a country needs to make and implement them uh, during a pandemic. So the fact that this institution did exist in many of our countries was very important for our response. And, and finally, we, we leveraged on this outbreak and we have leveraged on it very effectively to grow our laboratory capacity. But one mistake we must not make is make the mistake that was made in the PEPFA era where a lot of the funds that came into these countries, including ours, went vertically to develop lab infrastructure for one disease in most cases. So we must make sure that when we're investing in our laboratory infrastructure, we're investing in platforms that can serve for the diagnosis of all infectious diseases for which they are designed, and not only for the infectious disease that are the priority uh, of the moment for which it is built. So I just want to give one quick example uh, of a current challenge for which I think the ECHO platform will be an amazing opportunity um, if it was already um, um, you know, being used. So imagine the variance of concern and that this has just uh, come up. And everyone is talking about the B135 variant strain uh, that has suddenly in the last two months emerged in South Africa and is now, now accounts for 90% of the circulating variants, uh, viruses in South Africa after two months. So this happened between October to February. One new variant emerges, has some uh, 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 you know, mutations that has enabled uh, quicker transmission and suddenly has become the dominant uh, variant in South Africa. How does this affect transmission, uh, severity, outcome, diagnosis, therapeutics, vaccines. These are things that have to be learned very quickly, but also taught very quickly and shared so that the rest of the continent understands what is happening and can respond to it. So over a, over a weekend, basically, we were celebrating the first delivery of a million doses of the vaccine on the continent. And two days later, we were mourning uh, the announcement in South Africa that this, uh, that we probably cannot use the vaccine, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine to the scale that was anticipated because of the emergence of this new strain. And the study that then showed the reduction in vaccine efficacy uh, towards this new strain of contact South Africa has now gone ahead and said that we they will use the vaccine, but under limited and more uh, stringent conditions to actually understand the impact uh, of this new strain on their vaccination strategy. But what happened? Uh, if you look on the left, this is a, a study that was going on. Thankfully, this study preceded the predominance of this strain in South Africa. So the same study, but with data up till October, Last year, you can see the difference between um, the uh, placebo arm is the red uh, line you see up there. The treatment arm is the blue line. You can see that there's a wide 
a difference between those curves and they were looking at the vaccine efficacy of about 75% of the vaccine towards um, the uh, uh, virus that was circulating in South Africa in October. The same study with data analyzed post-October where the B135 strain was now becoming uh, the dominant strain shows that those two curves have now almost come together and the vaccine efficacy that we saw in the data pre-October basically dis disappeared. This is, yes, a, a fairly small study uh, done by Shapir Mahdi and colleagues in South Africa at WITS. Um, but, you know, this is just an example of emerging evidence that will then need for us here that haven't yet started our programs to understand why, one, we need to do a lot more sequencing, and secondly, we have to start planning for vaccine efficacy studies almost on the go over the next few years as we introduce vaccines um, for this new uh, virus. So to start concluding, uh, what is the role of uh, the regional echo consortium for, for all of us that have to make decisions around uh, viruses, pandemics, um, and things like that over the next few years? We want to equip our, our healthcare workers, obviously, uh, to protect themselves, uh, to learn, to understand what is going on, but also to be able to treat uh, patients with the best uh, current evidence. And, and we, we know that in 2021, we cannot be learning medicine the way we learned it in medical school. We simply cannot wait for evidence uh, to be published, one day to get into textbooks, and at some point for people to read them. We've got to find ways of moving a lot quicker and ECHO will really enable us to uh, do this, share information around diagnostics, around uh, the vaccine rollout that we're about to start, uh, use this information very quickly to make decisions uh, that will save uh, lives. So I just thought by ending with this picture, uh, you know, it's a favorite term for many people thinking about how the continent has uh, leapfrogged uh, in, uh, in many other areas of life. Uh, mobile telephony comes, into, uh, comes to mind, uh, banking sector comes into mind. I, I think it's time now that um, our health security um, engagement on the continent leapfrogs uh, all the traditional uh, uh, models for learning, traditional models for diagnosis, and we should be able to demonstrate uh, how we can leapfrog into the future, do things much more efficiently. And one good example I hope we'll be able to share very soon is how MPHCDA will lead us into uh, distributing our vaccines efficiently and effectively in Nigeria. And I hope the rest of us will learn from that experience, share it on the ECHO platform and refer to it as a source of pride uh, for, for ourselves, uh, for the region and for the continent. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, I hope that uh, at least inspires some of the work that we're going to do together over the next few weeks. Thank you very much, Dr. Chikwe, for that um, informational and um, interactive uh, keynote address and we particularly want to appreciate you for your leadership um, during these times that we are in. Thank you very much. Up next, we'll be calling on Dr. Mohamed Mohamed Saleh, Senior Public Health Specialist, Emergency Management with the CDC Nigeria to take us on a demonstration of the ECHO network. We're going to be taking questions from healthcare workers, in Ghana, Nigeria, and Cameroon. So we're going to have our panelists um, respond to their questions. Uh, Dr. Saleh, over to you. Uh, okay, good afternoon, colleagues, and uh, thanks, uh, Kachi. Uh, let me start by uh, congratulating uh, everyone of us uh, who have been able to join uh, this special session on the inaugural launch of the West Africa Regional Eco Project today. I also want to thank uh, all the previous speakers uh, for your submissions, uh, especially the last speaker, Dr. Chikwe, who has uh, shared uh, very brilliant uh, insights uh, on the various trends on uh, South Africa and how they emerge and uh, evolve through that uh, process. 
Uh, for today's uh, demo session on the question and answer, we're gonna have uh, three panelists uh, to join virtually, and I uh, will have, uh, like uh, she said, uh, three uh, healthcare workers who will be asking questions, and I will allow the panelists uh, to respond to them. Uh, but just to give an instruction that uh, uh, we'll be very conscious of time uh, for each of the panels, uh, panelists, I uh, will have you uh, run two minutes for you to respond to the questions uh, you will be responding to. Uh, on this note, I have the singular honor to first of all invite to the virtual uh, panelist session uh, Dr. Chikwe Hekwezu, who will be represented by uh, Dr. Chinwe Ochu, the Director of Programs Planning, Research, and uh, Knowledge Management of the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. Do we have uh, Dr. Chinwe uh, still on the line? I welcome you to the special pa panel. Ca can you just uh, say something to ensure that uh, you are on? Yeah, Dr. thank Chinwe, you very please. much. Can you hear me? Uh, okay. Yeah, okay, welcome, Dr. Chinwe. Uh, second uh, on the list, we have uh, Dr. Gerba Abdullahi, uh, who is the Director of Planning Research and uh, Statistics from uh, National Primary Healthcare Development Agency. He will be representing Dr. Faisal, the uh, DG of uh, uh, MPSDA, to join the special panel today. Uh, do we have uh, Dr. Gerba Abdullahi online? Dr. Gerba Abdullahi, are you here with us? Yes, I'm very much around. Uh, All good right, uh, welcome. Uh, Dr. Yeah, Chikwe, well, well, welcome uh, congratulations. You really made a very precise and very informative uh, uh, presentation. Congratulations, sir. So thank you, uh, Dr. Garba. Third on the panel, all the way from Ghana, our uh, colleagues uh, uh, join me to welcome uh, Dr. Ali Samba, the Director of uh, Medical Affairs at the <laughs> Kolebu Teaching Hospital, Ghana, uh, who has also been the forefront of uh, clinical response with respect to COVID management in Ghana. Uh, Dr. Ali Samba, uh, welcome. Are you on the line with us? Yeah, I'm here. Thank you. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, I had, uh, we've had uh, some submissions of uh, three questions uh, from the healthcare workers. One is from uh, Nigeria, uh, Cameroon, and uh, uh, Ghana. Uh, but I'll first of all uh, invite uh, the first uh, healthcare worker from Cameroon, Dr. Zay Albert, uh, to ask our question. Afterwards, we take the questions, I'll project the questions and give you two minutes each uh, to respond to these questions. Do we have uh, Dr. Zay Albert? Uh, can you ask your question? The first question? Uh, is uh, Dr. Zay Albert uh, on the line? Okay, so we can go to the second question from uh, Ghana, nurse uh, Susie Odio, who is a public health nurse from uh, Kolebu Teaching Hospital. Hello. Also. Hello. Is that, uh, yeah, is that uh, Dr. Z? Albert? Yes, this is Dr. Z. Albert. Thank you. I had uh, network issues. Uh, so we'll I want to thank all. Time. Yes, okay, yes. Ahead. I want to thank all the presenters, and I was uh, very interested with the vaccine, given the fact that uh, uh, there, there, there are a lot of things being done around vaccine introduction. So in terms of target population, I want to know with the, when the vaccines will be introduced for someone who has already been uh, infected and recovered, are they part of the target population or they will be excluded uh, during the vaccine introduction? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Albert. Uh, panelists, uh, please take care of that question. Uh, take note of that question. We'll take the three questions, the remaining two questions, after which uh, I give the floor to you to respond. Can we have the nurse from Ghana to ask a question? Yeah. Mr. Uh, nurse Susie, can you go on? Go ahead to ask your question, please. Uh, uh, it appears uh, Nosa Susie from Ghana is having uh, internet challenges. Can we go to the healthcare worker from Nigeria, from uh, General Hospital Bodo in River State? Can you ask your question? Um, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Uh, hello. No, Susie, can you speak now? Can you speak, please? Yes, please. Okay, okay quickly. Please, go ahead. Is there any role of use? Is there any role of using um, ivermectin for COVID-19 patients? Okay, thank you, Nosa. Susan, we've gotten your question on ivermectin. Uh, we've taken your Hello? question on uh, ivermectin. Uh, can we go to thank you. Uh, GH Bodo, uh, Mr. Aloysius Frederick? Can you ask your question? Mr. Frederick, are you on the line? Uh, 
Hello. Yeah, go ahead, please. Uh, time is not on our side. Can you go on? Go ahead. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, just as Dr. Iyeko has already highlighted, uh, talking about the new the new mutations of uh, COVID-19 strains, uh, as we have already seen in South Africa and also the United Kingdom, my question is this. Uh, have we seen this in Nigeria? And if so, uh, does it change our current approach to clinical and public health management of COVID-19? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, uh, distinguished listeners. And uh, let me uh, try to go back to the panelists. Uh, we'll start with the first patient that has to do with uh, COVID-19, that uh, if a patient uh, had, had COVID, uh, recovered from uh, COVID-19, will there still be a need for vaccination uh, for COVID-19? Can we turn it to uh, Dr. Gerba from MPSDA to respond to this first question? Dr. Gerba, please. Thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. Uh, and uh, I want to say clearly that this question is very valid uh, because I believe uh, people who are aware because of the availability of knowledge that viral diseases like yellow fever, like measles, who are all aware that once a patient uh, got infected and fully recovered, there's possibility that might have acquired lifelong immunity. Of course, even that one is changing with measles. So now we are talking about a novel virus. That is the bottom line. I think that, is, that should be understood. We are talking about a virus which is new. Everybody is learning, including WHO. Everybody is learning. All the researchers, all the experts are working very hard to learn about it. Therefore, the answer straightforward is to say yes, that irrespective of your vaccination status, I mean, your, your disease status, uh, you should be, you should be uh, immunized with COVID-19 vaccine so that you avoid the risk of reinfection, as well as you know, the, our, the morbidity and mortality that it can be forced by the disease. So it, we, it is strongly recommended that um, regardless of uh, your disease status, you should get vaccinated. In addition, we are with, as I said earlier, the knowledge is not yet adequate. Even the vaccine we are giving you, we are not, we are yet to know for how long is it going to protect you. The research is ongoing. And we believe when that information is available, we are going to tell you. But one thing we know with the vaccine is that it triggers immunity within the first two weeks. That one is very clear. And then we believe for every viral disease, of course, there will be stimulation of human immunity. You know, the natural immunity of the human body. So that level of immunity, we believe, if it complemented with the immunity that could be triggered by the vaccine, the body will be in stronger position to, you know, tackle any potential reinfection that a patient can get. Therefore, uh, it is good not, uh, not to take the risk. Even if you have fully recovered, definitely it is recommended that you should take the vaccine so that you can get yourself protected and, of course, you will not... Uh, uh, separate to other people. So it is this, this for, to answer this question is to say that even after recovery for now, for the knowledge that is available and also to avoid the risk of, uh, uh, of uh, the mobility and mortality, it is recommended that that patient or that individual is among the target population that is going to be immunized once the vaccine is available. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Garba, for that uh, elaborate and uh, elucidative uh, response on the vaccine. Uh, in the interest of that, I think uh, I would just encourage us uh, to move straight to the second question that has to do with uh, reported uh, a case series reports on the uh, use of uh, ivermectin in different uh, treatment centers. And I think uh, Ghana is very uh, well positioned uh, to help us uh, respond to this. I'll turn it over to Dr. Ali Samba uh, to respond by giving us uh, your experience and uh, what uh, knowledge base uh, you have to see with respect to this use of ivermectin. Dr. Ali Samba, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, COVID is a new disease and all sort of treatment modalities have been uh, put across. I mean, if it comes to social media, internet, all sort of treatment modalities have been put up. I mean, but I know that in countries, we have committees for standard treatment guidelines that recommend whatever treatment that the countries will roll out. Um, currently, there are insufficient data to recommend either for or against the use of ivermectin for the treatment of COVID-19. Uh, we, uh, we recommend that results from adequately powered, well-designed and well-conducted clinical trials are needed 
to provide more specific evidence-based guidance on the role of ivermectin for the treatment of COVID-19. So for us in Ghana, as long as our committee for treatment uh, standard treatment guidelines has not approved the use of ivermectin, we are not using ivermectin in any way for the treatment of COVID-19. We know that people have read and are using it, but it's not recommended nationally according to our policy in case management for COVID-19. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ali Samba. Uh, we'll quickly go uh, take the third question on uh, the new strains uh, on the COVID. Uh, and I will encourage us uh, to listen to Dr. Chingwe from our Nigeria Center for Disease Control. I know Nigeria was the first among African countries to do some uh, sequencing. Dr. Chingwe, please, can you share your experience? Thank you very much uh, for the question. Um, viruses mutate. Um, Mutation is a very common occurrence with virus. COVID-19 is not um, an exception. So the COVID-19 virus has been mutating and uh, new vir uh, virus strains have been detected in other countries of the world. Nigeria too has also detected um, the new virus strain in the country, specifically the UK variant. Um, we are building up and ramping up our, our capacity to uh, use sequencing to monitor the trend of the virus in country. And it will be very, very good once we're able to institute that kind of routine uh, molecular surveillance, genomic surveillance uh, for, for the virus. Nevertheless, uh, our approach in managing the, the outbreak has not changed as a result of these uh, new strains. It's still the same approach non-pharmaceutical intervention, or physical distancing, wearing of face masks, washing your hands frequently with water running water, uh, wiping on surfaces. So maintaining environmental hygiene. These are measures that will keep one safe from the virus no matter the strength. And that is why risk communication is an integral part uh, of our response to the pandemic. So we'll continue to do this and hopefully not just in Nigeria, but in other countries in Africa, we will be able to build up um, our sequencing capacity. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, distinguished uh, panelists and uh, healthcare workers uh, who have uh, asked questions uh, this afternoon. I think, uh, colleagues, uh, this is just uh, a demonstration of uh, the use of uh, questions and answers uh, that we'll be having in our subsequent uh, editions following uh, this launch. We don't have time. But in one minute, if I would just uh, summarize, uh, it is clear from uh, the experts uh, who responded to some of the questions you raised that, uh, yeah, uh, we, we quite know that uh, uh, COVID is still a novel uh, uh, disease uh, taken from the virus itself. And uh, we are not sure yet uh, if lifelong uh, immunity will be conferred on individuals uh, who survive it. So uh, the standing uh, you know, uh, recommendation is that uh, even if you have recovered, you should still go along and uh, take the vaccine. And uh, with respect to the use of ivermectin, uh, it is clear that uh, there is no clear global protocols that recommend or uh, do not recommend uh, the use of uh, ivermectin. Of course, uh, despite the case series report uh, across uh, the world, it will still be nice if we have uh, some further interventional uh, studies that will likely match control to some cases to see how effectively ivermectin can uh, reduce morbidity and uh, avert some uh, deaths in terms of uh, clinical use. And of course, we heard from uh, Dr. Chungwe, the last speaker, that yeah, uh, despite the mutations, uh, we are still uh, counting on the various uh, outline public measures that should be instituted. And uh, in that regard, countries are all uh, expected to institute a uh, routine genomic uh, surveillance so that uh, as these mutations uh, come up, we can uh, quickly uh, pick them and uh, institute uh, further measures. So I want to especially thank you this afternoon for listening. And uh, at this stage, I want to turn it over back to uh, colleagues from uh, UNB, Kachi and the Herita to uh, continue the coordination of uh, this event. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Saleh, for that interactive session. Special thanks to Susie, Frederick, Alfred, and our panelists, Drs. Abdullahi, Ochu, and Sa Dr. Samba from Ghana. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on now to the official launch of the West Africa Regional ECHO. And um, this will be taken by the West African Health Organization in the person of Professor Sombi Isiaka on behalf of the DG, Professor Stanley Okolo. Uh, Professor Sombi, if you're on the call, kindly go ahead and give the official launch address. Thank you. Thank you. 
Once again, I want to thank all the participants to be here. I, before to come to the lunch, I want to give some few words. You can remember that uh, the Ebola epidemic in West Africa gave us many lessons. And the head of state in the West Africa take this lesson together and start to implement some regional activities. The development of the regional RCDC, the implementation in each country, the National Public Health Institute for improved collaboration between all the actors. They set up the regional one health platform to facilitate collaboration between health sector and other sectors, and also the regional capacity building through the FLTP program. But when COVID come, it showed to us we need to continue to learn. And we now learn that importance of technology because with the public measure in early of the pandemic, nobody can travel, but we need to continue to deliver healthcare services, to continue surveillance and also to continue to strengthen capacity of health workers. This is bring the importance of this eco platform. As a regional body, we all know that quickly we start some capacity building through some seminar we organize with the West Africa. And we think that the seminar give us more lesson that continue capacity building, online capacity building is very, very important in the West Africa. This will bring opportunity to people to learn together, to share their experiences, and also to continue to communicate because we need to continue to strengthen our health system to be sure that for the next pandemic, we will be ready to be, to have a good response on that. On this way, and on the belief of the, behalf of the Director General of the West African Health Organization, Professor Stanley Okolo, I declare lunch today, the West African Regional Echo Program with our best wish for the success. Thank you to all of you. Thank you very much, sir, for that official launch address. Um, oh, I see some hands clapping in response to that. Thank you very much. Um, we'll move on to uh, the closing of our event. We're actually um, running short of time. And uh, for this segment, I'll be calling on Dr. Ali Samba. Dr. Ali Samba is the Director of Medical Affairs, yes. Kolebu Teaching Hospital, and the Ghana MOH Case Management Coordinator for the COVID-19 Task Force. Dr. Samba, if you're on the call, kindly go ahead and help us with the closing of the event. Thank you. Thank you very much. So soon, the official lunch is, uh, has come to an end. And for us, it's the beginning of good things to happen. Um, COVID poses a major challenge for everybody, even in the developed world. And we in Africa, especially in West Africa, with our limited resources, it's very, very important that we collaborate amongst ourselves to share knowledge and, of course, to also share resources. To um, we wish to thank everybody for participating in this official launch, the Federal Ministry of Nigeria, National Primary Healthcare, WHO, WAHO, the Ministry of Health of Ghana, Cameroon, CDC, University of Baltimore, and the New Mexico for bringing about this ECHO program. Uh, we hope that uh, with the knowledge that will be shared across, uh, we'll be able to fight this pandemic. Uh, we all know that uh, distance is a major challenge in a lot of the African countries with telemedicine and telementoring. We hope that um, our frontline workers will have the requisite knowledge uh, to be able to deal with whatever situation they are confronted when it comes to COVID-19. Um, yes, we have a lot of challenges, logistics, capacity, laboratory testing, ICU facility, among other things. And as the, the Director General of WAHO said, this is an opportune time for us to collaborate amongst ourselves um, and with good political will, 
And fortunately for us across the West Africa sub-region, uh, our various presidents have uh, demonstrated the political will to support um, the fight against COVID-19. So we thank everybody and we hope that at the end of the day, we'll achieve the benefit from this West Africa Regional Ecoware program. We thank everybody. Please stay safe. COVID is still around and it's causing a lot of havoc. So let's stay safe, encourage each other to stay safe, and we hope that in no time, this shall also pass. Thank you very much, everybody, for participating. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali Samba. We appreciate you. Um, we've come to the end of the event, and uh, we'd like to appreciate all participants, our colleagues, and all stakeholders that have joined this call. We thank you for your participation, and we say goodbye from the University of Maryland, Baltimore, Nigeria, and thank you for your time. Have a good day.